Hi, this is Ken Crotty, and I want to thank everybody for attending the webinar that we're giving today for Cuperts and Graphs in 30 Minutes Flat. <clears throat> so a Cupert is the acronym that we have for a Qualified Personal Residence Trust, and a GRAT is the abbreviation for a Grantor Retained Annuity Trust. Uh, we're going to go into the details on both of these planning techniques in a little bit and explain the benefits that you can have for your clients and or if you use these yourself, why you'd want to consider using them, and also some traps and things to be concerned about as far as the documentation goes. Uh, one thing to know about both Cuperts and GRATs are that they are statutory creations. Um, so you can go to the IRS code and regulations and they will lay out a description of the requirements for a Cupert and the requirements for a GRAT. Uh, this material also is available on BNA or RIA um, and also in revenue rulings and, and other IRS documents. So you have a lot of samples to work with. So it's nice to know that you've got certainty using these techniques. You don't have to be as concerned using these techniques as you might for some other techniques for other clients where they might be a little bit more aggressive. All right, so let's, we're gonna start with a Cupert discussion first. So the basics of a Cupert. A person transfers a personal residence to the Cupert. Uh, that's how the actual trust gets funded. The personal residence is defined as either the principal residence of the, of the grantor or the client in this situation, one other residence of the client, or an undivided fractional interest in either of the principal residence or another residence of the client. Uh, so again, it's either the principal residence, a vacation residence, or a portion of either of those two residences. Because of the fact that there's a limitation on the number of Cuperts that a client can fund at one time, meaning that the client can only have two Cuperts at one time, uh, because of that, if you have two Cuperts, one of them would be the Cuperts personal residence, and one of them would be a fractional interest in a secondary residence or another residence thereof. All right, so looking at the basics of a Cupert, the main thing with a Cupert is that when you create the Cupert, the grantor places the house or residence into a trust and retains the right to reside rent-free for a number of years, and that's called the retained term. At the end of the retained term, then what happens is that the residence passes pursuant to the terms of the trust. Typically, uh, we will have that be held in further trust for the benefit of other beneficiaries other than the grantor. Uh, it is possible to have it pass outright to other beneficiaries as well. Um, but for reasons that we'll discuss in a little bit, it makes more sense in many cases, especially if the client wants to use the residence after the retained term and pay fair market value rent for use, use of the residence to have the asset be held in a trust after the retained term, which can be a grantor trust, meaning that it's disregarded for income tax purposes and can be held for the benefit of the grantor spouse and or descendants. Now, one thing to note with a Cupert, and it's important to see here, is that if the client dies in the retained term, then the value of the residence is included in the client's estate. And why that's important is that um, if you do not survive the term, then the downside is that the planning technique did not work because the asset is gonna be included in the client's estate. So when you're determining the length of the retained term, you need to take into account your client's health, actuarial tables, and other assumptions to decide how long the retained term should be. All right, during the retained term, it is almost as if the client had not made a gift at all to the trust. The client resides in the house. They have the right to use the house, the sole and exclusive right to use the house. They also have to pay the fees that are associated with the house, such as taxes, maintenance fees, and repairs. Uh, so it's, it's, it's almost as if nothing had happened with respect to the residents during the retained term. All right, now, when you make the gift to the, of the residents to the trust, the fair market value of your right to reside in the trust for the retained term 
is determined based on IRS tables and regulations. The fair market value is calculated based on the number of years of the retained term, the age of the client when the trust is created, and the 75-20 rate for the month of the trust that it is created. Based on those numbers, and you can use software such as Tiger Tables or Number Cruncher, you will be able to calculate the gift that your client is making to the trust of the value of the remainder interest in the residence. Now, because it's the gift of a remainder interest in the residence, unfortunately, the gift does not qualify for the annual exclusion. So, if those people that aren't aware, the annual exclusion allows an individual to make a gift of up to $15,000 per person, per beneficiary, each year without using up any of his or her lifetime gift exemption. Currently, the lifetime gift exemption for each individual is $11,180,000. It's subject to inflation for adjustments upwards for inflation. And so many clients, especially under the new tax act where the increase has been relatively recent, have a lot of unused exemption that they can use. Uh, so this is, like I said, a cost benefit analysis determination you have to have with your client because the longer the retained term is, the smaller the value of the remainder interest. So therefore the smaller of the gift, but the longer the retained term, the more likely it is that your client might die during the interim. And if that happens, then the planning technique does not work. Now, because this is a gift of a future interest, the client is going to have to file a gift tax return when the, uh, when the gift is made to the trust. So if you make a gift now in 2018, you'll have to file a gift tax return by April 15th, 2019, unless you file for an extension to October of 2019. When the gift tax return is filed, you're going to want to be able to demonstrate how you calculated the value of the present interest and the remainder interest again, using the IRS tables and calculations. And in addition, to provide full and adequate disclosure, you're probably going to need to have at least a broker opinion letter, if not a full-blown appraisal for the value of the property being contributed to the cupid. So that's how you determine the value of the gift on formation for a cupid. Now, one planning technique that's available for a husband and wife is that rather than having husband or wife contribute 100% of the property to a cupid, husband and wife might want to consider taking the property, deeding it 50% to husband and 50% to wife, and then they each can contribute their 50% ownership interest to their respective cupids. Because of the fact that each cupid only owns 50% of the property, there'll be a discount associated for lack of control and lack of marketability with respect to the property. So if the house had been worth a million dollars, a 50% interest is not worth $500,000. The appraiser might apply a 15% or a 20% discount, reducing the value of the residence from 500,000, or the value of one half of the residence from $500,000 down to $150,000 or maybe even $300,000. And so if you're looking at that, that's going to be effective as a way to transfer additional wealth, as we'll see in a couple of slides. One other nice thing to note about using this technique is that you reduce the mortality risk because it's less likely that both husband and wife will die during the retained terms. And as a result, it's more likely that one of the two cuperts will be successful to transfer at least half of the property out of the value of the estate of the grantor. It's important to remember, too, that you do not need to have husband and wife with the same retained terms. These are two separate trusts. So one term could be for six years, one term could be for 20 years. It depends on the health and well-being of your client and the amount of exposure that they want to have to the risk of the planning technique not working. One other thing to note as well, and it's not mentioned in the, in the actual slides, is you need to be careful of the application of the reciprocal trust doctrine husband cannot create a, a cupid for wife and children and have wife create a cupid for husband and children at the same time. The IRS will unwind that and include the assets of each cupid in the husband or wife's estate. The way to get around that is that husband can create a cupid for the benefit of wife 
and descendants, and wife can create a keeper just for the benefit of descendants. That'll avoid the application of the reciprocal trust doctrine and allow you to still utilize this technique. All right, so if the client does survive the remainder term, or the actual term, then the client's going to pass, pass the residence on to the remainder beneficiaries. And what's nice about it is that when that happens, the fair market value of the residence that's in an excess of what was reported as the original taxable gift, which again was the current value of the retained term, passes without being subject to a state or gift tax. So it's a way of leveraging your gift tax use to pass additional assets without subjecting them to a state tax. Again, if the client fails to survive the retained term, the client's estate is going to include the value of the residence. One thing that is nice to know is that if you utilized this technique and the client filed a gift tax return and used some of his or her exemption, the client will get a credit for that exemption when he or she dies so that you don't waste the exemption. And even though you get the credit back, there's just no benefit of trying to use this technique. So it's a very low risk situation, especially if you use the actuarial tables correctly in accordance with your client's health and how long they expect to live. Once the QPRT retained term is over, if the client wants to retain use of the residence, the client needs to pay full fair market value rent for this. If it is in a trust that's structured as a grantor trust, the rent will be ignored for income tax purposes, uh, so you're not generating additional income for the client. Another nice thing is that the rent will reduce the value of the client's gross estate and reduce their potential exposure to estate tax liability. And because the rent is for fair market value, the rent's not deemed to be an additional gift by the client to the trust. So the remainder trust that owns the residence can get additional assets as well out of the client's estate without causing the client to utilize any more of his or her lifetime gift tax exemption. If the personal residence is sold or destroyed during the retained term, it can be replaced with an alternate residence or a second option is that the proceeds from the sale or the proceeds from the insurance associated with the destruction of the property can be invested in a GRAT. And we'll be talking about GRATs in a few more minutes. Because the client doesn't own the residence after the transfer to the trust, it is an effective transfer or an effective asset protection strategy for second homes. As most everybody's aware, under Florida law, your homestead is protected assuming that it's no more than half an acre in city limits, or if you're outside of city limits, it's you know, okay to be more than half an acre. But as far as protecting a second home goes, clients may need to consider forming an LLC, which could increase the insurance costs associated with the property. Here, even though the client retains the right to reside in the, the second home, it should be an effective planning technique to help provide additional protection because the residence is owned by the trust at that point. Couple final thoughts on QPERTs, and then we're going to show you one chart showing how beneficial they can work. Is that when the 75 20 rate is higher, or when real estate values are depressed at the time of funding and then expected to increase during the term, that's when QPERTs work well. So, right now, the 75 20 rate is going up. Uh, it's something to keep an eye on. Um, currently, it's increased from 2.2 to 3.4% in the last year. And again, if the rate of interest is higher on the 75-20 rate, it means that the current value of the retained term is going to be deemed to be higher, which means the remainder interest is less, which means that you're making a smaller taxable gift on forming the QPERT. And if you have real estate that you think is going to increase in value, that's when it really works well as well. So now to explain a QPERT, and this is a chart that we use for clients. We'll be happy to send it to you by Excel if you need it or are interested in it. Um, otherwise, you could probably form it yourself on Excel. But this is a way of how we can show the clients what will happen under different scenarios. So we have a 56-year-old client, and we're showing a 10-year QPERT, a 15-year QPERT, a 20-year, and a 25-year QPERT. Now, that means that the first line would be a 10-year retained term. And using that, the gift that the client would make would be 63.924% on funding of the trust. And that's the number that you can see um, in the column over there. I'll get my highlighter here. So that's the, the gift amount. And so 
the gift on formation, in this situation, we pretended we had a $2,140,000 home with a 15% discount for a 50% interest, is only $900,500, $909,500. So the value of the gift that was reported was $5,389,000. Based on actuarial tables, and again, these are actuarial tables, which means that for many of our clients, they have a better chance of surviving than you see here, because these are averages of the general population and many of our clients have excellent health or at least access to excellent health care. So a 56-year-old person has only a 10% chance, 10.7% chance of dying before reaching age 66. So this is a pretty easy idea. Nine out of 10 clients would survive the retained term. And if you go down to a 15-year cuper, you can see how the gift has been reduced to 48.793%. So it's only a $443,000 gift on formation. Now, what we show to the right of that is that the end of the residence at the end of the term, one half of the discounted value is at 7% growth going to be what you see here in this column. The estate tax, we're assuming that this entire amount would be subject to estate tax. So in this situation, we'd have $1,000,000 or $3,000 worth of estate tax due on a $2.5 million asset, 40% estate tax. The estate tax savings that you see here by using the Cupert is 826227 And that takes into account that if you had a $443,000 reportable gift, that could have sheltered $443,000 worth of assets from estate tax. At a 40% rate, what that's going to be equal to is $117,509 worth of estate tax. So the difference between the $1,003,000 and 177,000 is the 826,227, right? Now, what we do is we say, if the value of the home continues to grow at 7% a year for another 10 years, then in that situation, by using a 15-year cuper, you would save the family almost $1.8 million worth of estate tax. Now, if you had structured this so that the residence was held in a grantor trust, and the client used the grantor trust and paid rent to the grantor trust, assuming that the rent being paid was equal to 8% of the value of one half of the residence, and the rent was paid from year 16 through year 25, then that client would have paid an additional $2.7 million worth of rent. So that's value that's not in his or her estate. So at 40%, the estate tax saved on that $2.7 million would be an additional $1.1 million worth of estate tax. And again, this is assuming that your client would be subject to estate tax on all of his or her assets at the date of death. Assuming these assumptions are correct, the use of a 15-year cuper, where the client then paid rent to use the house for another 10 years, would save the family combined approximately $2.9 million worth of estate tax. So you can see it's a very effective planning technique. And again, because it's something that's been blessed by statutes, it's a very safe planning technique. You'll be able to calculate these numbers based on the IRS tables. The only question would be the value of the residence and the value of the discount associated with a partial interest of the residence. But as far as determining the value of the gift and the reported gift amount, that's a cut and dry actuarial table calculation. So now we're gonna to turn to GRATS. And again, GRATS are Grantor Retained Annuity Trust. With a GRAT, an individual transfers an asset or assets to a trust and retains a right to receive an annuity stream back from the trust for a certain term of years. It's called the retained term. Uh, the payment has to be made no less frequently than annually. However, if you want to have clients that want a quarterly income stream or a semi-annual income stream, there's no prohibition on, on making more than one payment. It just needs to be dictated pursuant to the terms of the trust. And what, similar to a QPERT, the IRS has tables and calculations which will allow you to value the retained interest being retained by the, by the grantor. So we look at the retained term and the number of annuity payments, and using the current rates and tables, we can determine what the present value is of, to receive all those annuity payments. The gift made on formation by the client when he forms or she forms the GRAT and funds the GRAT is the difference between the retained term value of those payments and the actual fair market value of the asset being contributed to the GRAT. And one thing that's nice to know is that with GRATs, most clients take, or most practitioners feel that it's okay 
to, quote, zero out a GRAT, meaning that you can set the annuity stream that the client will receive back from the GRAT as an amount equal to the assets being placed in the GRAT so that there will be no taxable gift on funding of the GRAT, and as a result, no gift tax return should need to be filed. So any assets remaining in the GRAT at the end of the term are going to pass pursuant to the terms of the GRAT into a remainder trust. They will not be subject to a state tax in the grantor's estate, and they will not use any more of the grantor's gift exemption when the transfer occurs. It's possible to structure the GRAT so that the, the trust could receive the assets at the end of the term and be held for the benefit of the grantor's spouse and or descendants. During the retained term, the payments can only be made to the grantor. No other beneficiaries can receive anything from the GRAT. If the grantor dies during the retained term, then the value of the payments that are required to still be made are included in his or her estate. Uh, the rest of the assets would still pass without being subject to taxation in the estate of the grantor. During the retained term, uh, the GRATs are disregarded grantor trust because of the terms of the trust. So the payments and any transactions are ignored for income tax purposes. Again, because they are created by statute, there are several rules that you need to follow. Um, they're well laid out in many taxable journals and other materials that you can find. You do need to make sure with the GRAT especially that you follow these rules because if you do not follow the rules, then suddenly you no longer have a GRAT and you could cause your client to have a much larger taxable event than he or she thought or intended on funding. A few examples of the rules are no assets can be added to a GRAT after it's initially funded. So if you're concerned that we might not be able to get all the assets in the GRAT on the same day, consider forming an LLC, getting all the assets placed in the LLC, and then assigning the ownership of the LLC to the GRAT. That way you're clear that all the assets went into the GRAT on one day. In addition, for the payments back to the grantor, the GRAT may not issue a promissory note back to the grantor. It needs to either transfer cash or other assets or marketable securities to actually make the payments. As I mentioned earlier, during the retained term, only the grantor can receive distributions from the GRAT. One item to note is that the GRAT payments, you have 105 days after the anniversary date to make the annual payment. Uh, so it's okay to be a little bit late, but you want to make sure that's calendar because if you're after 105 days and you haven't made the payment, then you have the potential of blowing the GRAT, which again will cause adverse tax consequences for the client. The annuity payment can be stated as a fixed amount or as a percentage, and it's determined on the value of the assets that are originally placed in the GRAT. So you don't need to worry about revaluing the assets each year to determine the payment. Now, if you're making payments with discounted interest in an entity, you will need to determine the value of the discounted interest to make sure it coincides with the correct amount of payment due back to the grantor at the time the payments are made. In addition, the GRAT payments can be level or you can front load or back load a GRAT rather so that the payments increase by 20% each year. And as we'll see in some examples, it generally works better to have the payments increasing by 20% each year because it allows for more appreciation in the GRAT during the early years of the term. So this is an example of a lifetime bypass GRAT. And in this example, if we had a husband or a wife create a GRAT for the benefit of the spouse, the spouse can be the trustee and the spouse can be the beneficiary after the two-year term. In this situation, we had a two-year term. We said $4 million would be assets that would be contributed to the GRAT. And in exchange for that, the client making a $1,000 taxable gift. So we would file a gift tax return reporting a $1,000 gift to the GRAT, which starts the statute of limitations running and would only utilize $1,000 worth of his or her lifetime gift exemption, assuming that the value of the assets contributed to the GRAT were not challenged by the IRS. In that situation, you're going to need a payment back of roughly 47.85% and then 57.41% in years one and two. So you're going to get a year one payment of $1.9 million, a year two payment of $2.3 million. And then you can see down below that that if the GRAP assets grow at 10% per year, after two years, you've pushed over $438,000 worth of assets out of the taxable estate of the grantor, and you've only used $1,000 of his or her lifetime exemption. If the GRAP assets only grow at 5% per year, you still manage to push over $100,000 worth of assets out of the estate taxable estate. One other thing to note, too, is under Florida, the annuity payments, 
there's at least an argument that can be made, if not that it should be, it's at least arguable, that they should be protected from creditors under Florida Statute 222. So it's something to keep in mind for clients as well that might be in a bit of a creditor situation or want to make sure that they have more protection. So again, just using some other numbers, if you placed a million dollars of cash in a grant and the grantor took back $200,000 per year in cash or other assets for five years, then at the end of the term, that $200,000, you'd have approximately $252,404 assuming that the assets grew at 7%. Now, this would result in the client having some gift tax due and payable on funding, but not very much, certainly less than the $252,404 that we're showing here. Grats are also a great planning technique to remember and think about if you have a client with a small business. So in this client assumption, what we're showing is that the client's company distributed out or earned you know, $3 million worth of annual income. Assuming a five-time multiple of the company would be valued at $15 million. And then if we apply a 33% discount for lack of control or lack of marketability, a 10% interest in the company would be worth $1 million. And you can see the calculations on how we were affording that and make it a little bit easier to try and understand for the client over here. So if we wanted to have a zeroed-out GRAT, what would happen? is that the GRAT would pay $119,635 a year back to the grantor, which you see on the payments over here. That would be for a 10-year term, and under today's 7520 rate, that would result in the client having an income stream equal to $1 million of present value, so there would be no taxable gift on formation. Now, if we look at the actual results of what could happen here, we have the annual annuity of $119,636, the client's GRAT owns 10% of the company, so it would get $3 million of annual income a year. And then if we assume that the excess cash of what it receives, I'm sorry, 300000 of annual income a year, which you see right here, and if we assume that the excess cash, which would be the amount between the 300000 and the 119 annuity payment each year, so 180000 plus per year, and if that grows at 7.5% and you keep adding $180,000 per year to the GRAT, which again is the money coming from the company up to the GRAT for the 10% ownership interest, then at the end of 10 years, the company has paid an additional $2.5 million worth of assets to the GRAT. So the GRAT's going to have $2.5 million worth of assets. And in addition to that, it's still going to own 10% of the company, which was another million dollars. So this technique in this scenario would pass approximately $3.5 million worth of assets out from being subject to a state taxable in the client's estate. So again, it really works well for a small business, something like that. Uh, again, we ran through some other numbers, which are self-explanatory, and it's the same idea. Again, we talked about the fact that the grad assets or annuity payments can increase by 20% each year. Typically, it's going to work better to have those assets increase by 20% each year because that way you're going to be able to front load or back load the GRAT so that you're going to have more and more payments and assets in the GRAT for the first number of years, passing more wealth to the beneficiaries. And we have some numbers here showing you the benefit of that as well and what the payments would look like in addition to that for the five-year period. A couple more things to remember, uh, and then, again, the remainder trust can be a disregarded trust for the grantor spouse and descendants. It allows the trust protectors the ability, if you have a remainder trust, a separate remainder trust that's not part of the GRAT itself, but the GRAT would actually pay to the remainder trust. The remainder trust can be modified by trust protectors, just like a, a re regular irrevocable trust could be, and it gives you family a little bit more flexibility in dealing with that and the other assets. We talked about the fact that the GRAT needs to be formed on one day, so this slide again reminds you of the idea of using an LLC to help form the GRAT on one day. And then consider also the fact that if the GRAT is going to be changed in a subsequent month, have language in the GRAT that allows for the adjustment of the annuity percentage to be equal to what had been intended when the drafting of the trust was done. If the 7520 rate changes during the time period when the GRAT was approved by the client and when it's actually funded and signed, then what could happen is the client can make a taxable gift without intending to. And we think the language that we show here at the bottom of page 32 could help prevent that by automatically adjusting the annuity amount to prevent the GRAT from causing 
to, it to be funded with a taxable gift in excess of what had been intended. Um, if the grat is going to be includable in the estate, which is the case when they're married, consider making a marital deduction with respect to the grat. You'll want to have language in the client's will and in the grat to help qualify the payments coming back from the grat for the, for the marital deduction to avoid imposing any estate tax at the time of death of the grantor. And again, you're going to want to execute a codicil to the will, changing it so that the payments from the grat will be the greater of the income or the annuity amount, even though in most situations the income would be less than the annuity amount. It's better to be safe than sorry. And also preventing the 105 delay so that the client's spouse is receiving the income at least annually like he or she needs to. A couple more things to consider, and then we'll let you go, is that grats work best with advantage, taking advantage of market volatility. For that reason, a two-year grat typically will work better than a four-year grat. If you have two very good years and two very bad years for stock growth in a four-year grat, at the end of the fourth year, you may not pass any assets on. If you had had a two-year grat and you had two good years, then those assets would pass that were left in the grat at the end of the two years. You could fund a second grat for two years, for years three and four, and if that grat didn't have any assets at the end of the term, then it would fail. And it, but you still would have the assets passing in the first two years outside of the grat and outside of the estate. So it's something to consider. And along those same lines, if you have a client that has large blocks of stock that he or she wants to contribute in certain corporations, it's best to have one grat for block A, one grat for block B, again, to take advantage of the volatility instead of averaging the growth between the two assets. So I want to thank everybody for their time. We appreciate it and hope everybody has a great day. And thanks again for paying attention. If you have any questions or you need anything related to this, feel free to send us an email. Thanks very much.